I couldn't see my parts in the way my clients could. They were talking about them as if they were watching a movie almost. And when I went inside, it was pretty dark, but I could sense them and I could hear their voices in a way. So that calmed me down about maybe these clients are sicker than I thought because I knew I wasn't a multiple personality disorder client. Welcome to Beyond Theory, a podcast powered by Metals Behavioral Healthcare that brings you in-depth conversations with firsthand insights from the front lines of mental health and addiction recovery. I'm Dominic Lawson. All of us have these parts within us. Sometimes those parts build us up with positive affirmations, but some of them can be our harshest critics. Dr. Richard Swartz says that the mind is naturally multiple, which is a good thing. But how are someone's parts differentiated from, say, multiple personality disorder? Let's get out of the abstract and see how this applies in the real world. It's time to go beyond theory. This is Dick Schwartz. I'm the developer of the Internal Family Systems model and also on the faculty at the Department of Psychiatry at Harvard Medical School. Awesome. Dr. Schwartz, thank you so much uh, for coming on the Beyond Theory podcast. It's such an honor to have you here on the show. Happy to do it, Dominic. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, And so, Dr. Schwartz, if you would, just kind of share some background uh, on you, if you don't mind, for our audience. Okay. Um, I have a PhD in marital and family therapy, and I I graduated from that program in about 1980, and uh, I was one of those sort of obnoxious family therapists that thought we'd found the Holy Grail and that you were wasting your time if you did a lot of intrapsychic work because we can change all that by just changing external systems Then made the mistake of, of uh, testing that <laughs> assumption, which was the, the onset of my development of this internal family systems work. So in terms of my background, um, yeah, I, I was born in... Uh, in North Carolina, moved to Evanston, Illinois when I was five, and so went to school there, and I was, I'm the oldest of six boys, to, and my father was a very prominent physician researcher, head of medicine at Rush Presbyterian St. Luke's, which is a big hospital in Chicago, and uh, I was supposed to be a big shot physician. And three of my brothers are, actually. And I was the oldest, and uh, a lot of my, what I call burdens, came from the fact that I just didn't have a head for school, and science in particular. And uh, I think some of that was because of the pressure from him. So he was very easily frustrated with me, and I went to a school called Knox College, and... uh, Again, it was great to be out from under all that, but I wasn't, still wasn't a good student. I didn't do that well and didn't take to any of the, the particular majors that were available. So I graduated in 71 without a lot of ambition or direction and was kind of a hippie or a hippie wannabe back then. But then I got a job from my father working in the psych unit at the hospital he was head of medicine of, and saw a lot of the problems that were happening in the way the, this was a adolescent unit and the way the adolescents were being treated there because it was a very psychoanalytic unit and uh i was an aide so i was around on the weekends when the families would visit and i would hear the families tearing into these kids who would become my friends really i wasn't that much older than them and then I would hear about their therapy sessions with their psychiatrists where they wouldn't talk at all about their families. Instead, they would just try to interpret a lot of things that were going on in their minds. And that seemed kind of uh, bizarre to me, like this is no way to do it. And so I got some direction from that. I just decided there must be a better way. That's what got me interested in family therapy. And so then I, I did my PhD at Purdue University, which was a great little program, no longer exists there, but a lot of uh, prominent family therapists have come through that program. And I was in the early days of it, 
uh, my, my mentor there was a guy named Doug Sprinkle. And uh, yeah, that's some of my history. Gotcha. Thank you for sharing that, Dick. Um, if you would, you know, you, you kind of talked about your, your, your dad a little bit. I imagine he had a, quite the influence uh, on you a little bit. He gave you that job that you talked about. Kind of talk about your dad a little bit, if you don't mind, Dr. Schwartz. Yeah. Um, he was in some ways a really good father. He was, he could be quite affectionate and supportive, but he, I think he had untreated PTSD from World War II, where he was a uh, captain of a medical corps that liberated Dachau. And so he was in charge of rehydrating all the, pay, all the people there and never talked about it. And so he, he could kind of explode if we screwed up and would quote unquote spank us, which uh, I think I got most of it. <laughs> which were more than spankings. You know, he, he would be shaking with rage when he'd do that. And so at the same time, he was the parent that I could get the most affection from. He also was scary to me. But to whatever degree I came out with uh, some degree of attachment, he also was a good role model in terms of trying to be a good scientist. And he told me to follow the data no matter how far outside my paradigm it carried me. And that really served me well as I started to get into this world of parts because a lot of what my clients were teaching me was really contrary to what I'd learned in school and, and to uh, what the culture believes about, about the inner world. So yeah, he had a big influence in both ways. He, I think his frustration with me and the burden of worthlessness I picked up from that drove my ultimately when i got direction it drove me to really try to contribute and to persist in the face of a lot a lot of uh, opposition from various sources both from my field of family therapy and also from psychoanalysis and and cbt <laughs> so a lot of scars from the early days um yeah anyway that that was my dad Gotcha. And, and you talked about your dad telling you to follow the data and you was talking about parts uh, early. And that kind of leads us uh, to the uh, the IF, IFS model uh, that you have um, uh, created. Kind of talk about that part, uh, the IFS model, the parts. Uh, and I also remember seeing that you, you talked about it was a little bit scary when you kind of uh, uh, stumbled upon it a little bit when you were talking to uh, some of your patients. Kind of talk about that a little bit. Yeah. So. As I implied earlier, I, I decided to prove that family therapy had found the holy grail in psychotherapy. And so I did an outcome study with a colleague named Mary Jo Barrett, who uh, is still a good friend. And we gathered together 30 bulimic kids back in 1981, I think, um, and their families, and did straight what was called structural strategic family therapy with them. and and succeeded in reorganizing the families the way the book said to do it. And still, at least a bunch of my clients continue to binge and purge. And so out of frustration, I began asking why. And they started teaching me this model because they started talking about these different parts of them that would sort of take over and make them do things they didn't want to do and make them feel terrible. And they were talking about these parts as if they had a lot of autonomy. And they fought with each other inside, and they, some of them uh, could be horrible critics. And, and then the critic would bring up a part that made them feel worthless and empty and alone and young. And that part was horrible to feel. So to the rescue would come the binge and would take them away from all that and make them feel better. But then the critic would come back for the binge and call him a pig, and so on and so on. It just sounded like this dreadful, vicious cycle inside that would go on for days. And as a systems guy, as a family therapist, this started to sound a bit familiar, but it was also quite scary because, again, they were talking about these parts as if they were sort of like what are called alters in people with, then the diagnosis was multiple personality disorder. And so I thought maybe these clients are sicker than I thought. 
And that I held that position until I started listening inside myself. And, oh, my God, I've got them, too. And some of mine are as extreme as theirs. So I got over the fear, and then I just got curious about, is there a way to look at this inner system in the same way I was looking at external families? And indeed, it turns out there is. Dr. Swartz, you just talked about looking in, inside yourself and, and noticing those different parts. And we have a lot of clinicians who listen to the Beyond Theory uh, podcast. Kind of talk about that part a little bit, because I think that's fascinating where, you know, it, it kind of goes against uh, some of the teachings, but you, you really start to dig a little deeper. Kind of talk about that, if you don't mind, Dr. Swartz. Yeah, so I could identify with that critic because I had a part that, uh, was pretty brutally critical of me that, you know, internally sounded like my father, my father's voice, uh, when he was at his worst. And and that would bring up a part of me that felt absolutely worthless and ashamed. And then I would have various, what we now call firefighter parts that would come to the rescue, one of which was uh, binging on food, not maybe as, as extremely as some of my clients were, as constantly, but yeah, I could notice, yeah, I do that too. <laughs> At that point, I could start to identify and, you know, I couldn't see my parts in the way my clients could. They would talk about them as if they were watching a movie almost. And when I went inside, it was pretty dark, but I could sense them and I could hear their voices in a way. So that calmed me down about maybe these clients are sicker than I thought because I knew I wasn't a multiple personality disorder client. Gotcha. Uh, and, and so if you would just kind of break down the internal family, uh, um, uh, in, internal family systems model, if you don't mind, Dr. Schwartz. Sure. So at first, when my clients were talking about these parts, after I got over being scared, I started to think maybe there's a way to change and intervene in the way we did with families, but I was making the mistake initially of assuming the parts were what they seemed, which is the mistake that most of psychotherapy still makes and our culture certainly makes. And so I started to try and get my client to fight with the critic and stand up for herself, try to control the binge. And my clients were getting a lot worse but I didn't know what to do except tell them to fight stronger and fight harder or control more until the first client that I worked with that I knew had a very extensive sex abuse history and also cut herself on her wrists. And at that point was doing basically trying to do kind of family therapy work where I would have my clients talk to these parts and uh, sometimes in what's called the open chair technique or the empty chair technique from Gestalt therapy. But one client said, you know, I don't need to hop around in these chairs. I can just sit here and do it. So I would coach them on, on uh, talking to these, these parts. And one session we decided we wouldn't let my client leave the office until the cutting part had agreed not to do it anymore. And after a couple of hours of badgering that part, it finally said it wouldn't. And, then I opened the door of the next session and she had a big gash down the side of her face. And that was the turning point in the history of this work because I shifted out of that coercive place to just kind of being shocked and then curious, just asked, why did you do that? Why do you want to do this? And the part sort of dropped its guard and talked about how when she was being abused as a child, it needed to get her out of her body. And and contain the rage that would get her more abuse. And so then I shifted again. Now I have a kind of appreciation for the heroic role it played in her life, and I could extend that to the part, and it broke into tears because everybody had been trying to get rid of it. And so that then led me to try a similar kind of curious approach with all kinds of other clients' extreme parts and found over and over that once approached from that place, they would tell similar, you know, secret histories of how they were forced into their roles and how much they didn't like doing what they did to the client, but they thought there was no choice. And as they talked, it became clear that they weren't living in the present, that they actually were stuck in those trauma scenes. And they actually thought the client was still quite young and had to be protected in this way. And they also 
carried what I would describe carrying what I came to call burdens, the definition of which is an extreme belief or emotion that came into you from some kind of a trauma or an attachment injury and attaches to these parts almost like a virus, like the coronavirus. Right. And then drives the way they operate thereafter. And so it started to dawn on me that I and the field had, had mistaken the part for the burden it carried. And we'd been demonizing them and trying to get rid of them when, in fact, we were trying to throw the baby out with the bathwater. And that if you approach them with, uh, and the, with the curiosity and calm and confidence that self, what I call self brains, ultimately they'll happily leave their jobs. Right. So I'm trying this with lots of different clients and amazed, you know, each time I'd say, let's do it with this one. That can't be a good part. <laughs> you know, and I worked with not only people that would hurt themselves, but also people who had hurt other people. I started trying it with uh, people who who'd uh, raped others and had murdered people. And we'd go to those parts and even those would tell their secret histories of how they were forced into their roles and how they still carried this desire for revenge or desire to hurt vulnerability and that they got that from the perpetrator and so on and so on. And so I started to conclude that maybe there aren't any bad parts. And it turns out that some 40 years later, uh, that's true. <laughs> thousands of people using this and thousands of people all over the world, we can safely say there aren't. And that's a radical discovery and is the title of uh, my latest book, No Bad Parts. So that's probably the hardest assumption for the field to accept, but it really, really changes how you relate to clients when you accept that. And as I became more curious, I, again, I'm a systems guy. I'm trying to figure out the way this whole system operates rather than just focus on one individual part. And it turns out that <clears throat> they operate in many ways like external families. So it became clear that there were parts that had been very hurt and carried burdens like worthlessness or shame and emotional pain and and uh, terror, actually. And as I got to know those, uh, they had been, before they got hurt, these precious inner children that we all love to be with. But the trauma injected them with these burdens because they're the most sensitive parts and they, they're the most vulnerable. And so they took on the sense that I'm bad or, or the world is terrifying, or uh, just this in intense, intense pain. And once they get burdened like that, we don't want to be around them because they can pull us in back into those scenes and make us feel as bad as we did when we got hurt initially. And so we tend to lock them away in inner basements or caves or abysses thinking we're just moving on from the memory, sensations, emotions, and beliefs of the trauma, not realizing that in the process of doing that, we're locking away our essence, these precious parts that, once they're unburdened, can make us feel very, very happy and delighted with the world, playful and creative and loving and so on. So those we call exiles, anybody with any kind of trauma history has a bunch of exiles. I mean, most everybody in our culture has a lot of exiles. And when you get a lot of exiles, you feel more delicate and the world feels more dangerous because so many things could trigger those exiles. And when they're triggered, it's like an explosion of flames of emotion are going to consume you and take you out and make it so you don't get out of bed or, or just make you feel all those feelings again. And so other parts are forced out of their naturally valuable roles into becoming protectors and their job is to both contain these exiles so they don't explode and also protect them so they don't get triggered so many protectors try to control the world and control your body so you don't feel that uh, so they might 
be the parts that don't let people get close enough to ever hurt you again, or they're focused on your appearance so you don't get rejected, and they can be those critics that are constantly telling you you're fat or ugly, or they focus on your performance so that you get accolades to counter the worthlessness. So those also can be the critics and critics trying to goad you into trying harder and working more. There are caretaking protective parts that take care of everybody else and don't let you take care of yourself. There are protectors that keep you in your head, don't let you feel your body so that you never feel these feelings again, and so on and so on. There's a lot of what we call manager roles because they're all just, they all just have the same goal, which is to manage your external and internal life so that you don't feel any of that. And many of our managers are those critics because they're just trying so hard to make us behave and keep us under control. And they don't know what to do but yell at us the way our parents did. And they'll take on our parents' energy to do that. But there's a variety of different manager roles, and those would be called the defenses in other systems. And the world has a way of breaking through those defenses and triggering our exiles. And again, when that happens, it's a big emergency. These flames of emotion can really take you out and make you so you can't function. And so there's another set of parts whose job it is to immediately go into action in a sometimes very extreme way, impulsive way, reactive way, to get you higher than the exile's feelings or get you distracted until they burn themselves out or douse the fire with some substance. So we call those firefighters. And many, you know, the Meadows is all about working with people with firefighter behaviors that are out of control. So that's the system, that's a map to the territory that uh, I, I created many, many years ago, and it's held up really well over all these years. Understood. Thank you so much for sharing that, Dr. Schwartz. I want to ask you about some of those managerial parts, I ima- especially in particular when you talked about the caretaking part, because I imagine a lot of times in, in families, you have that one particular family member, maybe it's the, the oldest brother, maybe it's the, the oldest cousin or the youngest cousin or something like that. And that part, that that caretaking piece, uh, it, it it becomes so uh, daunting where you're taking care of everybody else, like you talked about earlier, but you're not taking care of yourself. But sometimes we may like that part or that's kind of our family brand, uh, if you will. Uh, how do you navigate that part, uh, if that question makes any sense, Dr. Schwartz? Totally makes sense. And, and that's true for a lot of firstborn. Not me. You know, I... <laughs> I was, uh, I guess you'd call me a rebel, and, and very contrary to firstborns, I didn't take care of my brothers, and you know some of them still resent me for it, um, because I felt alienated by both my father's pressure and my mother's rejection. But most, many uh, firstborns are dominated by those caretaking managers, but Also, because we are in such a patriarchal culture, many women get that role and are just uh, socialized to lead with that caretaking part to their detriment. So it it is a, a big problem because in doing that, they wind up exiling the parts of them that want things for themselves and want to have a life and want to be able to assert themselves or get angry at times. And if you exile all that, then those parts are going to give you symptoms of some kind. Uh, I wanted to ask you this because you, you mentioned your book, uh, No Bad Parts. Uh, I know there's a, a forward written by Alanis Morissette. You was also actually on her podcast a, a few years back. I want to ask you this when it comes to uh, parts and celebrity, is that a, another element to it because of celebrity or is it just the same? Kind of talk about that if you would, Dr. Schwartz. Well, you know, uh, celebrities you know i haven't worked with that many celebrities but the ones i have worked with have parts that uh dominated them to get to their status and made them work really some in some cases work really really hard and take all kinds of risks right. and and again they are so caught up in that and in, in the status of it that they exile parts that wanted other things in their lives that they didn't pursue or 
didn't want to have to be driven all the time and instead wanted to stop and smell the roses. So, yeah, but that's not just celebrities. That's, you know, CEOs. That's so much in our culture. Our culture care. I, I, I talk about what I call legacy burdens. So the burdens I've talked about so far are personal burdens like mine that came from my experience with my father and mother. But there's another class of burden called legacy burdens that we inherit from our direct lineage sometimes, but also from our ethnic group and, you know, things that happened to that group maybe even centuries ago that just kind of trickle down. And then also there are these burdens that are floating around in our culture that we all absorb. And the most pernicious of those I've identified as uh, racism, patriarchy, which I just mentioned, and individualism, and then materialism. And that combination of individualism and materialism sort of inject most all of us with this sense that we're not successful, we're not worth anything unless we're making a lot of money or, or being a celebrity of some kind. And so most of all, most all of us have a part that's pushing for that and makes us feel terrible if we don't make it. So anyway, I'm not sure how I got onto that, but. No, I, I definitely understand that part. You know, where, where you talk about uh, the, the parts that kind of drive us to uh, that, su- that success, whether it be celebrities, high achieving uh, individual. So I, I definitely understand that. So I appreciate your insight there. And, and going back to your book, No Bad Parts, you have many uh, exercises that you kind of share uh, throughout the book. I'm curious about the daily uh, IFS meditation. Could you talk about that one a little bit? Yeah. Um, you know, maybe first I should uh, identify self because I haven't talked about that yet. So what I consider the biggest discovery of IFS is, and again, this is this contradicts a lot of things in psychotherapy, including attachment theory. Uh, what I found was that just beneath the surface of all these parts, as I would try to help clients uh, identify them, but also get some space from them, get, get them to separate so they weren't so what we call blended all the time. And then when they could get some space, which is sort of like mindfulness, getting more separation and noticing rather than being overwhelmed by these thoughts and emotions, which turn out to be coming from these parts, this other person would emerge who would have these wonderful qualities that would lead to a healing experience for the client where instead of hating, say, that critic, suddenly as I would get the part that hates the critic to relax and step back, they would suddenly just out of the blue be curious about it and calm relative to it and wanting to get to know it and also have compassion for it out of the blue. And I would try that same process with other clients and it would like the same person would pop out from the depths suddenly, spontaneously, and and, and really commonly uh, simply by getting certain parts to open space inside. And when I asked clients about, now, what part of you is that? Because that's great. Let's keep that around. They would say some version of, that's not a part like these others. That's me. Or that's myself. So I came to call that the self with a capital S. And now, almost four decades later, and thousands of clients later, thousands of people using this all over the world, we can safely say that that self is in everybody. It's our essence. And it's our birthright. And it knows how to heal. When you access self with a client in a session, it will start to take over the session. It will start to relate to the parts in a healing way. And it also knows how to heal in the outside world. So it, it's great for you've got two battling couples and you get them to stop and get their parts to step back. And suddenly they're able to talk in a totally different way and heal their relationship. So. That's the big deal, I would say, about IFS, that not only is there this kind of uh, healthy observer in us, but there's this very active, good leader that gets accessed when parts open space and starts to do the healing process, which leads to the unburdening of these parts, which then allows them 
to immediately transform into their naturally valuable states, almost like a person has been lifted and they, because all of them, you know, for me, it's the nature of the mind to have parts. They're not the product of trauma. They're, they pre-exist the trauma. They're in there to help us in our lives. They all have valuable qualities and resources, but they're forced out of that into these extreme roles. So the unburdening releases them, liberates them, so they can be who they're designed to be instead. And self sort of is born with the knowledge of how to do that. So that continues to amaze me even after all these years. Dr. Schwartz, you know, in that same vein, when you talk about the unburdening, do you see or maybe some of your clients kind of experience a, a identity crisis, if you will, because you've been so engaged in some of those burdens and of those parts that you kind of like, well, I was kind of this person. I'm not that person anymore. I guess kind of talk about that a little bit, if you don't mind, Dr. Schwartz. Yeah, that's not uncommon either, particularly when we help them separate from certain parts that, like you said, have dominated them and might be called the ego and other systems. Um, we call them self-like parts. They're parts that sort of emulate self, but are still parts with their own agendas and they're still trying to protect because self doesn't, self can protect, but it, it, it doesn't have that same level of agenda. So, you know, most of, many people are so identified with that kind of part that they think that's who they are. And then it is a big identity crisis when they separate and say, oh, no, that isn't me. That's this part. And who am I? And fortunately, if, you, if they don't freak out and they stay with it, they'll say, they'll realize there is this other essence to them that actually is wonderful. But yeah, there is that crisis at first. Dr. Schwartz, you uh, mentioned the Meadows earlier. I want to mention to our audience that you are a senior fellow uh, here at the Meadows. Kind of talk about uh, that collaboration, that partnership, and, and being a senior fellow at the Meadows. What does that mean to you? Yeah, I, was, I felt very honored by that. You know, I have always admired the Meadows. It's always been seen and talked about as the top place for people with all kinds of problems. And I, I was very honored by the interest they had in IFS and have really enjoyed our collaboration now. I don't know how many years it's been, but maybe five, I'd say, and have been out there and and there's been a IFS training program that C Sykes led. Yeah, it's very exciting to me. We haven't had this kind of collaboration with another facility. So I'm just uh, thrilled with that. And they've also been very generous to me. And you know, some of what I teach is a challenge to traditional ways of thinking about and treating addiction. So I was also a little leery going in, but not anymore. I just feel quite embraced and uh, very collaborative. Gotcha. And, and before I ask the last question, Dr. Schwartz, I just want to say thank you so much for coming on the Beyond Theory uh, podcast. In closing, uh, like I said, we have a, many clinicians who listen to our show and aspiring clinicians who listen to our show, just speak to them really quickly about when they find data or things uh, at the ground level in practice, private practice and things of that nature that may challenge the status quo. Uh, what is some advice you would give those clinicians who uh, want to just follow the data and just kind of see where it leads? Yeah, just stay curious. That, that was what got me here. and. If they do, they'll learn the same things that I learned, which, you know, I, I mentioned earlier something about challenging the addictions field. And what I've found when we work with addictions, for example, is that not so much focusing on the addict part to try and get it to change in the beginning, because many times that addict part, when you get to know it, is actually saving your life because it's a firefighter. And the next firefighter on the hierarchy is suicide. So the part, when you ask it, what are you afraid would happen, which is one of the common questions we ask, if you didn't get him high all the time, we'll say something like he would die. And you might, you know, laugh at that. But it's true if, the, if suicide is the next one on the list. And a lot of these kinds of addict parts won't change until what they protect is healed. Some of them will. 
But if the focus is exclusively on sobriety and not on honoring the part from trying to protect so well and learning about what it protects and healing the exiles that it protects, then danger becomes that the person becomes like a dry drunk and has managers that now are exiling not only the exiles, but also the ad addict part. So that's just a little example of what I learned that contradicts so many things that uh, staying curious got me to. Dr. Richard Swartz is a systemic family therapist and an academic. Grounded in systems thinking, Dr. Schwartz developed internal family systems, IFS, in response to clients' descriptions of various parts within themselves. Find out more about his work at ifs-institute.com. Beyond Theory is produced and hosted by me, Dominic Lawson. You can discover more, including videos of some of our conversations, at beyondtheory.com. For more information on Meadows Behavioral Health Care, go to MeadowsBH.com. Finally, thank you for listening, and I hope you join us next time for another episode of Beyond Theory.